Wah, gas cool. Descending upon planets like an avalanche of purest violence, Wah Gazgul leaves behind a trail of wreckage and devastation. It is an orc crusade that threatens to spread across the galaxy, stomping flat all in its way. All orcs are violent and barbaric, but there is one amongst their untold masses who is feared above all others. More than a mere warlord, he is the self-proclaimed prophet of the orc gods themselves. He is the great green embodiment of all the brutal strength of Gork, the most belligerent and ferocious of them all. He also boasts the ingenious cunning of Mork, for none are cannier or make craftier plans of war than he. He is the overlord of the greatest greenskin crusade of recent times, with tides of orcs at his command. He is Gazgul Mag Uruk Thraka, and when he storms into battle, the whole galaxy trembles. This entry holds the details of the savage splendor of the most famous orc invasion force to ever take over a planet. War Gazgul. To face an oncoming orc horde is a fearsome thing, but if those greenskins are part of War Gazgul, they become even more formidable. In addition to the relentless fury of their attacks and the crude but effective technology many orcs sport, those in Gazgul's force bring something else. They employ unmatched tactical cunning, unique gadgets created by the mech genius Orchimedes, and a brand of fanatical wah energy like no other. The Ultimate Warrior As the galaxy's most numerous warlike race, it has long been said that, should the orcs ever unify, they would crush all the so-called civilized peoples of the galaxy. Now, as the hour grows dark, that doomsday draws near. With every crunching step of his great metal boots, orc warlord Gazgul Thraka strides closer to realizing that dread prediction. In the 41st millennium, and throughout all history, the brutal orcs have often been underestimated by the other powerful races in the galaxy. While all have learned to fear the destructive might of the Greenskins' migratory crusades, these are seen as temporary events. They sweep across a few systems before stalling, their tide of advance ebbing and ultimately receding so that they become little more than a footnote in the history of some other race. However, the war led by Gazgul Thraka is different, for this war boss is the most dangerous orc alive. His mighty green crusade is no mere planet crusher, but an invasion that will shake the foundations of the galaxy in a war for total domination. As a race, orcs are not bound in history. They neither revere the past nor record it in any manner. Greenskins are creatures that live in and for the here and now. What makes the orc whose full name is Gazgul Mag Uruk Thraka so dangerous is that he has vision not just for the present, but for the past, and most importantly, for the future. After all, he is no mere orc, but rather the living prophet of the orc gods Gork and Mork. Gazgul is their mighty instrument of destruction made manifest. When the galaxy-spanning Imperium of Mankind first encountered Gazgul, its leaders presumed he was like all the other orc warlords before him. Perhaps he was larger and stronger than most, but no more than that. After several battles, they begrudgingly granted that Gazgul possessed more beast-like cunning than was exhibited by the other leaders of his savage race, but they still gave him little credence. Very few of his human antagonists started to grasp the magnitude of Gazgul's ambition, but only by the time of the third battle for Armageddon did they realize that this was an orc world beyond any they had previously encountered. Those opponents who have underestimated Gazgul only do so once, for they rarely survive contact with the warlord. The few fortunate enough to escape speak of raw power and armies beyond count, all guided by the same grand vision. Unlike other orcs, 
Gazgul has shown a remarkable ability to learn from his failures. With each fight, he grows stronger and more cunning. Over the years, he has refined his tactics, devising new strategies based on his observations in previous battles. More ominous still for his foes, Gazgul has developed the power to experiment, to test out new concepts in order to better hone them. Whether the voices Gazgul hears in his head are truly those of Gork and Mork is unknown. What cannot be gainsaid, however, is that the canny orc appears to have some prescient ability. Time and again, the orc warlord appears in exactly the right place at the right time. Gazgul has proven to be a master strategist, the greatest of his kind. He outmaneuvers his enemies, steamrolling over their assaults and sidestepping carefully laid traps as if anticipating them in advance. In his lengthy campaigns, Gazgul has shown to be a masterful organizer whose prepared assaults rival the meticulous battle plans of the Estra Militarum. However, there is nothing of the hidebound tactician in Gazgul, for he is an innovator and a cunning opportunist, ever ready to shift his troops to exploit any sudden weaknesses an opponent might present. And there are no fighters more brutal, more joyous in the act of crushing their foes than the raucous, battle-loving warriors of War Gazgul. As some of the Imperium's foremost tactical minds have already learned, Gazgul is their strategic match or more. But the news grows worse for those that would oppose the oncoming green wave. Gazgul's hordes are growing in number and skill, and he is gathering under his sway not just mindless followers eager to do his bidding, but also mighty warlords who would not bow before any other orc's dominion save for Gazgul's. Confident in his own matchless superiority, Gazgul has avoided a common pitfall amongst his green-skinned kind, that of attempting to do everything himself. Other warlords feel they must always lead from the front, spearheading all attacks, while keeping as watchful an eye on their own lieutenants as they do upon the enemy. After all, it is a personal disaster for a warlord to be surpassed in deeds by any of his underlings. By contrast, Gazgul's authority is so absolute that he need not display such caution. Instead, he cunningly deploys his forces to where their talents are best used. Exemplifying his age-old maxim, Don't send a speed freak to do a dread mob's job. Due to Gazgul's strategic prowess, his ability to adapt, and the sheer force of his character, he now leads the greatest force of greenskin seen in millennia. This war is poised not to just ravage a few planets or trample a star system or two. It is on a course to conquer the entire galaxy. Rise to Power At the close of the 41st millennium, the name of Gazgul is spoken in fearful whispers in many alien languages, a name synonymous with dread across the galaxy. It was not always so. The greatest orc warlord began his climb to infamy as just another orc warrior slogging it out on a backwater world. At the very edge of Segmentum Solar lies a now frozen orb that was once a sporadically populated planet of Urk. Its history has been largely forgotten, buried beneath successive invasions, but it was first named Oroclias, after it was founded by an exploration fleet launched from Terra during the Dark Age of Technology. It was part of the Zornian star system, and the tides of the warp flowed strongly to that point, making it an excellent hub. Humanity prospered on Eurocleus, for it was a world rich in minerals, and within a hundred years the colonies had grown to thriving cities and busy spaceports. It was undoubtedly the light and activity that drew the orcs. They swept across Eurocleus like wildfire. They raised it to the ground before disappearing aboard their great junk fleet, riding the warp tides to seek other exploits. As is their way, though, the green skins unwittingly left behind traces of their spores, and one day they would rise again. Due to the flow of the warp, it was inevitable that spacefaring races would again find the habitable Zornian system. Between barren periods, 
the world became an Eldar outpost, the home of a cluster of Spindorians and a Hrad Warren. At times, the long dormant orc spores would erupt, and swarms of greenskins would develop in some secretive corner of the planet. It was not until the time of the Great Crusade that mankind returned again in force. It was the Dark Angel Space Marine Legion who cleared the planet of its life forms and again planted the flag of humanity upon it. Once more, the planet was dubbed Uroclius. For over 2,000 years, mankind mined there, built their high cities and tethering spaceports to its twin moons. Minor Xenos raids occurred, but it wasn't until the middle of Millennium 32 that a great greenskin war swept the system. It was the largest recorded orc attack upon the Imperium, with dozens of invasions blazing across all five segmentums. Soon the Zornian system fell into orc hands. As Oracleus was overwhelmed by greenskins, the last survivors of that world boarded the vast star freighter Dominion and escaped into the sudden shifting warp. The tides of the warp had altered, making the Zornian system no longer easily accessible. Thus began a long period of stagnation for the Orcs. For nearly 8,000 years, Oracleus, renamed Urk, was a battleground for warring greenskin tribes. At first, they fought over the ruins of the high cities, clashing over the best loot. These battles devolved, as did the piles of plunder they fought over. As the millennia ground on, the wars continued. No leader proved large enough to gather more than a handful of the tribes or clans beneath him, so an equilibrium of squalor became the way of life. Small orc warbands fought each other for possessions of an ever-dwindling pile of scrap iron and derelict machinery, and it was into this bleak cycle of futile violence that Gazgul was born. A Strange Path to Greatness In a curious twist of fate, the Imperium of Mankind may have had an unsuspected hand in creating the most formidable orc of this era, and perhaps of all time. After years of fighting orcs and monitoring their presence in outlying systems, the Imperium had learned that, under the right conditions, even sporadic orc population could multiply with startling speed. The rise of a strong warlord could unite the feuding clans, triggering a mass release of spores. Should this gathering grow large enough, it would act as a beacon to orcs on nearby planets, drawing them into a swarming migration that built with frightening intensity. In less than a Terran decade, orcs could go from being a minor nuisance to the world's dominant species. The Imperium has found that if a rising war can be detected and countered early enough, the orcs can be broken and dispersed at little cost. Thus, in systems known to be plagued with greenskins, various watchposts are deployed. In the Zornian system, the Dark Angels had established a range of monitoring stations coordinated by a command sanctum in a barren mountainous region of Urk. This hub routinely fed scans and other information back to the nearest Dark Angels vessels. In this way, the greenskin numbers were regularly checked and the Dark Angels could also keep track of the feral human populations of the system, for they were always searching for new recruiting planets from which they could draw battle-tested warriors. Ironically, it was this very monitoring station that set Gazgul on his journey to greatness. The stripling warrior Gazgul was a trooper in a goth warband that took part in a raid upon the Space Marines' command sanctum. Although it was hidden atop a remote mountain crag of Urk, it was not safe from the orcs. Always seeking scrap, the Greenskins discovered the hidden base and sought to dismantle it, triggering the base's auto-defense systems. During the initial rush to claim the base, Gazgul was hit in the head by a bolter shell, a shot that pulverized a large section of his cranium and turned a sizable portion of his brain to absolute mush. It was quite possible that the young and profoundly bleeding Gazgul might have been left for dead then and there, but for two circumstances. Gazgul got back to his feet, a sign of toughness and grit that any goth respected. Also, it was widely known that a particularly adult death skull pain boy was paying those who brought him fresh material to work with. 
The carrion birds did not feed on Gazgu that day, as his own mob guided him onwards. He was a stumbling wreck and had to hold his bleeding brains in with both hands, but they eventually reached the Death Scar's outpost of Rust Spike. There, his own mob traded Gazgul to Mad Doc Grotznik for the sum total of three teeth and a new chopper. Mad Doc Grotznik. On his home world of Urk, Mad Doc Grotznik had gained quite a reputation. Like all pain boys, he had a fascination with getting his hands dirty. However, he was so anxious to experiment that he was loath to wait for willing patience. It was well known that the Mad Doc would pay to have unwitting or unconscious patients delivered to him. So long as he got a cut of the action, Grotznik's warlord, Gregnmech, the leader of the region's Death Skulls, turned a blind eye to Grotznik's habit of taking in these operations from out of clan. This was for two reasons. First, a great many of Grotznik's patients came down with a nasty case of death, so his work rarely helped any other clan. Secondly, and perhaps more importantly, Greg Mech's bionic opticals, installed by Grotznik himself, did not work. This meant the warlord was blind in one eye and often missed out on key details. And so it was that mad Doc Grotznik was unobserved while he operated on a badly wounded young goth warrior named Gazgul. After two gore-spattered hours, the deed was done. Whether it was Grotznik's tinkering around with Gazgul's brain, the accidental inclusion of a foreign object in his brain pan, or sheer confidence after his operation, Gazgul was never the same again. Later, when it became clear that Gazgul was hurtling along the path to greatness, the pain boy was more than willing to take complete credit. In truth, when word got out that Gazgul could channel the divine wishes of the Orc guards, Grotznik had long queues of the richest knobs waiting outside his tent, asking for the Gazgul special. The Great Green Visions Gazgul came out of his haze immediately after mad Doc Grotznik performed his pivotal operation. That he awoke was a surprise to both parties, for Grotznik had replaced part of the Goth's warrior's skull and brain with bionics, wires, and squig sinew, holding it all in place by riveting on adamantium plates. More amazement followed. Gazgul could see more clearly than he ever had before. This had little to do with his eyesight or new bionic eye, which truthfully was always a bit out of focus. Rather, for the first time in his short life, Gazgul awoke with a brand new vision. It was his destiny to rally all of Orchidom and to lead them on the greatest war of all time. It was now his belief that he was in direct contact with Gork and Mork, the great green gods of the Orcs, and Gazgul realized he had been chosen as a living embodiment of their divine wishes. They wanted him to lead the way towards the greatest battles in the galaxy. The first to fall beneath Gazgul's iron-shod heel was the Death Skull's warlord, Dregmech. Gazgul had just emerged from Mad Doc Grotznik's grimy tent and was still rubbing his shiny adamantium-plated pate when Dregmech approached. Striding down the street that ran between the corrugated shacks of the derelict Death Skull's outpost, Dregmech demanded to know what a goff was doing within the boundaries of Rust Spike. Behind Dregmech, his entourage of knobs guffawed, anticipating a bit of sport. Undaunted by the massive, cobbled-together combi weapon that the Death Skull's warlord was waving in his direction, Gazgul advanced, knobby fists clenched. Dregmech expected exactly such a move from a gaff, and opened fire. Every barrel of his custom weapon began to blaze, the air was filled with flying projectiles, and the flashing of half a dozen gun muscles emitting blinding strobes of light. Perhaps it was a sign from Gork, or possibly Mork, a stroke of divine intervention to save their prophet, as although explosions blossomed at his feet and bullets stitched patterns alongside him, Gazgul advanced untouched. The only sounds were the last of the spent shells clattering to the ground, the spinning whir of empty ammo hoppers, a few desperate trigger clicks, the heavy tread of iron boots, 
and finally a rusty squeak of Dregmec's iron jaw fell open. So savage was the pummeling that Gaiasgul delivered with his bare hands that Dregmec's mobs cheered despite themselves. The headbutt, delivered from Gaiasgul's newly armoured skull, finished the job with a resounding clang. Straddling the pulped body of his foe, Gaiasgul announced that this was only the beginning. He bellowed to the gaping onlookers, that he was the prophet of Gork and Mork, and furthermore, his bull voice roared that if anyone was looking for some of the devastation he had just delivered to their former warlord, then they could step up one at a time or rush together. He cared not. After another hour of solid fighting, a battle in which Gansgul did not himself take any more damage than a scratch, he had taken over as rightful ruler of Rustspike. Though it was hard to see much with their bruised and battered faces, it seemed to his new followers that Gazgul grew larger before their eyes. Urk United By crushing the tribes within reach of his new stronghold, Gazgul began to increase his horde. In addition to the Death Skulls that had followed Dregmec, there were now several goth mobs beneath the young warlord. As tales of Gazgul's deeds circulated through the scrap heap villages and makeshift fortresses of Urk, orcs began to leave their tribes and head to Rustspike, looking to be part of something bigger than their own dismal warbands, fighting over the same old scrap. They wished to go to war with this new boss who claimed to talk to Gork and Mork, who asserted that one day they would find richer targets. Soon, Rustbike grew so overcrowded that it was impossible to spit and hit the ground, so Gazgul went west. It was on the cracked plain of the Big Wasteland that Gazgul met his first setback. He had entered the territory of the Bad Moons, the richest and most envied of the local clans. The Bad Moons' leader was warboss Snazdaka, and none could match the mix of firepower and mobility that was his bright yellow battle wagon brigade. When Snazdaka saw Gazgul's hordes marching across his lands, he ordered his totem pole raised, and the tents collapsed, and, faster than a runt herd could throw a wayward grot, the tribe was on the move. In the running skirmishes that followed, Snazdaka and his boys were always able to lob a few shells into Gazgul's hordes before driving off out of range of retaliation. Gazgul had already proven his superior brawling skills by overpowering, bludgeoning, and working over all who dared challenge or defy him. Now, however, he was engaged in a battle of wits and tactics. Here, too, the up-and-coming warlord would not just display his superiority, but the kind of brutal showmanship that makes orcs punch their fists into the air and raise raucous cheers. Within days, Gazgul unleashed a number of countermeasures, any one of which would have proven too much for the Bad Moons to overcome. He had his lads sabotage the supply dumps, where Snazdaka refueled his battle wagons. Gazgul then gauged the wind and ordered several shanty towns put to the flame. The thick, acrid smoke drifted over the cracked plains, hiding the exact whereabouts of his troops' movements and making it impossible for the Bad Moons to flee until Gazgul's infantry was right on top of them. Most impressively, Gazgul had coerced the fastest orc on Urk to join him by outracing him in a one-on-one -on -one duel of speed. All who saw it agreed that only the divine might of Gork and Mork could have allowed the now hulking goth warlord to outpace grand speed boss Shazfrag of the Evil Sons. Each and every one of Gazgul's tactics worked wearing down the bad moons so their defeat was inevitable. As the humble Snazdaka watched, Gazgul ordered the bad moon mechs to fashion an enormous power claw from the rubble of their ruined tanks. So did all the bad moons on the planet fall into line. So large had Gazgul's horde grown that no warband on Urk could hope to stand before his sweeping onslaught. Only the foolish or the stubborn even attempted to stand apart from the meteoric rise of this great greenskin. Champion One such stubborn fool was Snakebite warboss Grudbolg. It took a long, bloody week to subdue the Snakebites under Grudbolg, and Gazgul was forced to decapitate the scarred old monster twice before finally winning his loyalty. When challenged to a headbutting contest by the hulking goth champion, 
Ugrak, Gazgul was like a pile driver, sinking his foe a full boot into the ground and knocking him unconscious. Ugrak's knob's mob was so stunned that their undefeated leader had lost that they did not see Gazgul striding towards them. In a fury, Gazgul worked his way through the knobs, leaving each senseless. When the heads of Ugrak and his knobs finally cleared, they quite sensibly pledged eternal allegiance to Gazgul. Battles of attrition had raged across the surface of Urk for nearly 8,000 years, with small tribes continually rising and falling, each time battering themselves and those around them into submission. No great leader had ever emerged from the endless cycle over all that time. None could unite the tribes. Until now. The flickering finger of fate. It took six years for Gazgul to fully subjugate Urk. Now grown larger than any warlord ever seen on the planet, he basked in his dominion. Inspired by the spirits of the rising war and Gazgul's impassioned speeches about conquering the stars, the orcs swarmed across the planet's surface in a flurry of activity. A smattering of ramshackle ships began to arrive as orcs from across the Zornian system felt the siren call and hastened to join. For the first time, groups of mechs worked together, building in ways never contemplated before. Never before had they been able to mass their squalid resources, but now all of the scrap heaps were as one. Crazed energies flowed as they cobbled together vast battle fortresses, new weapons and towering engines of destruction. All of Urk's greenskins moved with a sense of destiny, an overwhelming realization of their duty, their very purpose for being. And then the sun flickered. All the greenskins looked up at the suddenly dimmed sun that had always lit the planet of Urk. All save Gazgul himself were cowed. The superstitious orcs dropped their weapons and spanners and stared upwards, slack-jawed in wonder at the celestial phenomenon. The sun flared, blazed, and once more, its rays blinked. In his booming voice, Gazgul assured the quavering greenskins that this was a sign from Gork and Mork. It was telling them that it was time to leave Urk behind, that it was time for the galaxy to feel the might of the growing wah. Even as the warlord spoke, a lone beam of green-tinted light illuminated the prophet of the great green guards. He told his followers to stockpile all the arms and ammunition they could, for they were leaving within the week. As there were few operating aircraft upon Urk, and the mechs had only just started to construct more, some greenskins wondered how this might happen. A single glare from Gazgul, however, was enough to silence their questions and instill in them, if not confidence, then at least a fear of asking how any such thing might be accomplished. The next day brought no dawn. In this case, however, it was nothing to do with the strange behavior of Urk's son. The warp currents had changed again, reverting to patterns similar to those of ages ago. As the tides of the warp roiled and twisted, they had also deposited an enormous space hulk into real space, vomiting forth the conglomerate craft in the Zornian system. The hulk now drifted in Urk's orbit, blocking out the light from the flickering sun. Exodus As solar flares and radiation storms wafted from Urk's tortured sun, Gazgul turned to his mechs and bade them secure the Space Hulk using super-heavy tractor cannons. A few of the available spacecraft were equipped with harpoon rockets, and they fired these off to tether the Space Hulk to one of Urk's twin moons. For the moment, the Space Hulk was pinned, but all knew it would not be for long. Under Gazgul's orders, the remaining orcs rushed to assist the mechs. They worked non-stop to craft as many crew transport ships as they could. There were perhaps 100 constructions worthy of being called ships, while other craft were built to complete only a single journey. There were many hundreds of these crewed rockets, each incapable of being steered, each with orcs and equipment wedged into every hold and crawl space. Boarding the largest of this crewed fleet, Gazgul led the great exodus from the planet to seize the Space Hulk. With exhaust flashes and more than their share of premature detonations and mid-air collisions, the departing craft filled the sky. 
some ships struck the space hulks outer decks and detonated to blow gaping holes into the superstructure. A few rockets ploughed deep into the hulk to deposit their orc cargo, while the most sturdily constructed ships actually had the weather with all to fly about the vast space hulk to seek outlanding sites, or at the least, to enter the vast hulk through the massive holes blown in by the less fortunate rockets. Alas, as is so often the case, the space hulk was not unoccupied. As soon as the first wave of orcs landed, they were attacked by demonic entities. Burner boys cutting their way through bulkheads had to suddenly shift from slicing metal to defending themselves against a tide of demons. Gouts of dirty orange flame were met in kind by arcane blue jets as the burner boys traded scorching death with prancing pink horrors. Before their ships had even settled, speed freaks launched themselves from cargo ramps racing down cavernous corridors, guns blazing. Less than half of the Orc spacecraft were able to lift off once again, but these disengaged in order to go back to Urk's surface to ferry more greenskins into battle. The fighting took weeks, during which time billions of greenskins were airlifted off Urk to join the fray. Gazgul himself led the spearhead that fought its way to the center of the Space Hulk, there, at the black heart of the jumbled amalgamation, was an ancient craft, none other than the vast star freighter Dominion. After leaving Urk, though called Uruklias, to escape the orc attack, the craft became lost in the warp, its terrified human cargo attracting the horrific creatures that dwelled there. The Dominion had returned home, but where its warp engines had once been located, there was now a huge warp rift a darksome hole from which the energies of the Immaterium poured forth. Having driven the demonic hosts before him, Gazgul ordered the mass firepower of his entourage to be turned against the tear in reality. To his frustration, this did nothing to it. With a bestial roar and leaking raw green energy from his reconstructed skull, Gazgul charged the rent. To further anger the warlord, his power claw proved equally ineffectual and, with an almighty challenge, Gazgul unleashed the full thunder of his best headbutt. There was a flash of green, an audible pop, and, at last, the rift collapsed upon itself. Whether it was the force of that blow or the latent psychic energy within Gazgul, it was done, and the demon threat ended, at least for a time. The Space Hog, which Gazgul named World Killer, was now in orc control. Just as superheated gas clouds swept over Urk, World Killer shifted back into the warp. And they call it Armageddon. Though the orcs aboard it were assailed by demons again and again, World Killer's long journey finally came to an end. Whether by fate, the bind luck of warp travel, or the will of the orc guards, the Space Hulk emerged into real space in perfect attack position above a planet of the Imperium. The future of a thousand worlds hung in the balance. How long Gazgul and his followers drifted in the warp is unknown. Time passes strangely there, and orcs keep no records. They explored the bounds of the vast Space Hulk, finding strange technology, ancient machines from humanity's lost past, and other apparatus beyond their comprehension. For some, especially the Death Skulls, this meandering search included nicking everything not bolted down, as they worked alongside burner boys whose arc welders cut through metal, the orcs were able to appropriate everything, no matter how well fastened it was. On Gazgul's command, many mechs began working on a force field projector. Meanwhile, competing warbands fought to gather scrap and minor wars broke out over salvage rights. This rivalry kept tensions at just the right level to prevent the volatile orcs from growing too bored. Sheets of iron decking were reworked into battle wagons, used to plate up stompers, or beaten into crude body armor to outfit knobs. In the mad furore to claim metal, several warbands were swept into the warp when they overstretched their boundaries and cut away sections in the Space Hulk's outermost walls. It was this kind of foolishness that allowed warp entities to re-enter World Killer. Several more demonic incursions plagued the journey, 
and Gazgul had to drive out the worst of these warp offenses personally. With vicious battles breaking out across the Space Hulk, there was an abundance of violent war energy, and the orcs thrived and multiplied. Soon, every cranny of the craft was bursting with more greenskins. Everywhere, swarms of grots scurried. The halls rang to the sound of chance shooter blasts and the commands of the ever-busy mechs. Gradually, the demon tides ebbed. The jubilant orcs were beginning to get restless when sudden jolts alerted all that the lumbering space hulk was slowing down. With gut-lurching suddenness, World Killer ripped back into real space. What had been an empty void was now filled with the massive space hulk. Aboard the sprawling vessel, klaxons blared, and Gazgul's voice boomed out of speakers and down corridors, telling all to prepare for battle. Like a tidal wave, the momentum of World Killer sent the Space Hulk crashing forward. It smashed aside defense stations, while panicked picket ships accelerated to get out of the path of the hurtling wall of space junk. The Orcs had emerged at the edge of the star system vital to the Imperium, heading straight for the core planet. Before them sprawled the immensity that was Armageddon, an industrial giant of mankind's realm. The planet lay roughly 10,000 light-years to the galactic northeast of Terra. It was a vital node of navigational channels, and its countless manufactorum supplied munitions to Astro Militarum regiments throughout the sector and beyond. No force in the galaxy could now stop World Killer from crash-landing onto Armageddon. Guided by his visions, Gazgul did not wish to alter his flight. Rather, he welcomed the headlong plunge towards the world below. The acceleration built, and the Hulk thundered down from Armageddon's sky like a scrap iron avalanche. Up until this point, Gazgul had only made a name for himself on Urk, a little known and soon to be dead star system. Soon, however, his name would send ripples of fear across hundreds of thousands of worlds. Now, Gazgul was on a collision course with greatness. World Shaking Arrival Surrounding Imperial fleets, long range missiles, and the planet's orbital defense lasers did their best to stave off the inevitable. Their firepower managed to shear away a few chunks of the oncoming Space Hulk, but they could not stop the terminal dive of World Killer, nor could they alter its course. Although shorn of a good deal of its mass by desperate salvos, the enormous Space Hulk plunged through Armageddon's polluted atmosphere to crash land upon its largest continent, Armageddon Prime. The deep impact of the landing shook the entire world, and its blast wave caused untold devastation. A cloud of debris shrouded the sun. Hundreds of thousands of orcs were instantly immolated by the cataclysmic contact of the landing. Their losses, however, were but a tiny fraction of their number. As the shock faded, a few of the orcs realized that they should all have died in that epic crash. Gazgul claimed it was the protection of the guards, although the force field projectors absorbing the brunt of that impact doubtless helped. Regardless, the orcs roared their approval at being alive after the exhilarating ride. Eager to release their pent-up aggression, they poured out of drop ramps or simply blasted new exit holes through the already torn and rent ruins of the remaining hull. Gazgul divided his followers into five distinct hordes, each under one of his most powerful warlords. These were leaders Gazgul had subdued upon Urk, ferocious orcs that had learned by fighting alongside him. Under the dust storm's darkness, the towering war overlord pointed out the direction each of his sub-commanders should take. With a wave of his powerful claw, Gazgul launched endless columns of orc war machines and living seas of infantry. With one voice, many millions bellowed. The defenders of Armageddon were not ready for what hit them. The Astra Militarum and the planetary defense forces of Armageddon may have been well equipped, but they were wholly unprepared for the waves of violence that swept across their armies. It was clear that the humans underestimated the strategic ability of their foes. They had fought orcs before, but these greenskins were different. This was not some petty warlord's formulaic assault. This was Wargazgul. 
Although none of his sub-commanders displayed the sheer audacity and cunning of their master, Gazgul had beat enough into their skulls about tactics for some of it to stick. They easily overwhelmed the PDF legions that advanced out of the hives to contain them. First, the orcs launched assaults to pin their foe in place on the flat ash wastes, whilst biker mobs and battle wagon brigades raced around to encircle their foes, cutting off their supply lines. Then the greenskins tightened the noose. They set up their mech gun batteries to pummel the packed defenders left in the ever-shrinking cauldron. Desperate attempts to break out were met with gun lines. Mercilessly, the orcs mowed down anything that moved, guffawing at the lines of humies that advanced to meet only death, aping their final curses as they twitched their last upon the blood-stained ash. With the plains cleared, the orcs advanced on the hive cities, and there they were astounded. Built atop sprawling, ash-blown desert wastes, the highs rose up taller than mountains. These were the great factory cities of the Imperium, the lifeblood of its non-stop war efforts. This was industrial might on a scale never before seen by the orcs. The mechs gazed at the highs with joy, imagining how they could repurpose such works, what they could build with such colossal hordes of material. The Fall of Hive Vulcanus The Imperium's defense of the hives proved more formidable. The Astra Militarum's numbers were augmented by every regiment available, along with hastily armed citizens. A long series of trenches and redoubts encircled each vast walled complex. Gazgul took one look at Hive Vulcanus before vowing boldly that it would fall in two days' time. Although his hordes were numerous enough to overwhelm the gates, Gazgul did not want to waste his strength. He had yet to unleash the full terror of his gargant big mobs, but he thought the prodigious firepower should be saved for when it was truly required. Instead, his plan to take the enormous factory city reflected his cunning. It was simple. It just needed flawless execution and seamless cooperation, a tall order for a typical war leader, but not so for Gazgul. The outer barriers were targeted by blitz brigades, armoured wedges of battle wagons. The first wave bore rams, and it was their duty to break open the outer walls, using their tracks to carry them over the rubble. The second group of attackers followed in the wake of the smoke-churning orc battle wagons. These were the mobile infantry, mostly goth boys, with the mobs of burner boys alongside them. The third wave was composed of scorchers. Their orders were to drive through the breaches and to clear any defences with sweeping flame. Tractor beams would target the gates as the battle wagons cleared the last trench. Timed correctly, the loaded wagons would be at top speed just as the doors were ripped off their hinges. Secondary plans included a storm boy's airdrop and stompers with wrecking balls opening up holes at strategic points. When the waves of infantry were finally released, they could enter Vulcanus at will. The plan worked almost too well. The hive would have fallen in a single day, were it not for its fierce resistance. Within the narrow confines of the hive's underways, desperate humans resorted to all manners of traps and ambushes. Despite their heroics, hundreds of thousands of orcs swept into hive Vulcanus, and its population was massacred or enslaved. After High Volcanus was captured, the remaining highs of Armageddon Prime soon followed. Columns of human refugees stretched past the horizon, and all of Armageddon Prime lay under the massive metal heel of Gazgul. What were once manufactorums were converted to workshops swarming with orcs. Slaves were worked to death, stripping their own cities of every scrap of resource that the mechs could use to fuel the Greenskin's war machine. The Wa proceeded southwards towards the heavily populated continents of Armageddon Secundus. The real battle begins. When Armageddon's season of shadow set in, the cyclical time when the planet's volcanic mountains erupted, the turbulent skies were permanently crimson-hued. To the orcs, this was another sign of their impending victory. To get to Armageddon Secundus, the orcs had to cross a vast swathe of equatorial jungle considered impenetrable by the humans. The fetid swamp region was a morass of mud pits, 
that could submerge armies at a time, and it was filled with ferocious wild beasts. The Greenskins reveled in it, attacking the flora and fauna whilst the mechs erected pontoon bridges or protected force fields across the sinking bogs. By their drive and cobbled ingenuity, the Orc hordes pressed through faster than Imperial armies could march. Infantry, armoured columns, stomper mobs and towering gargans crossed the crude bridges and emerged from the far side of the jungles. Once again, the Orcs caught the humans unprepared and smashed through their defensive positions. As the Orcs raced across the ash deserts towards the high cities, the towering god engines and tank companies of mankind advanced out into the barrens to meet them. From that point on, the battles were more fiercely fought, and all casualties began to mount. First was the clash on the parched desert known as the Death Barrens. While the colossal war engines of the Iron Skull's Titan Legion dueled with the Gargans, the massed enemy tanks began to blow great holes in the Orc hordes. The Greenskins did not waver, but continued to advance, albeit more slowly, into that thunderous barrage. The energies of the war might have been drained there and then, were it not for the dread mobs. Clanking forward, these iron-plated tank killers strode through the shell storm. A land armada of death dreads, killer cans, and hulking morconauts lurched into the enemy armored formations. Explosions lit up the plains as power claws wrenched off turrets. Buzzsaw arms reached in to savage the exposed crew and the screams of the eviscerated victims were music to the orcs' ears. With the foe's tanks reduced to smoking wreckage, the stompers and death dreads used their firepower to tip the scales on the evenly matched duel between the Gargans and the Titans. Towering mushroom clouds rose from the destroyed Imperial Titans, and the concussive blasts of their detonation slew many orcs. But when the shockwaves ceased, the green tide flowed over the enormous craters the bloodiest of seizures. The seizures that followed brought the Armageddon War to a new state of savagery. By now, the humans knew what lay in store for them, and their resistance stiffened. The orcs sacked Infernus Hive after Blood Axes struck a deal with its corrupt governor, but they could not break through the great hive cities of Hades or Hell's Reach. In desperation, the Imperial side launched virus bombs, Wicked and proscribed technology from their distant past. Hundreds of thousands of orcs died, but still they pressed on, battering themselves against the high cities for little gain. With his sub-commanders flummoxed on how to break through, Gazgul was forced to direct the assaults himself. Gazgul tried many ploys, lightning assaults, feints, overwhelming wave attacks, and mass bombardments. Airdrop storm boys attacked from the skies, while the sewer tunnels were infiltrated by the craftiest commandos. At Hell's Reach, these stratagems paid off, each offensive advancing more deeply into that spaceport hive. With the streets red with blood, Gaskell's final tactic, to gather the weird boys together so their war-addled minds blasted forth a psychic storm, worked perfectly. Paralyzed by madness, the defenders were overrun. In Hades, each of Gazgul's moves was parried. The storm boys were ripped from the skies by anti-aircraft fire. The commandos were met by tunnel fighters in a running battle that stymied the underground advance. Siege engines were sabotaged and suicide teams took down gargans. The defense of Hades' hive was masterminded by Commissar Yarek, who was destined to become the most respected Yumi that War Gazgul had ever met. The Unexpected Counter-Strike As Gazgul fixated on tearing Hades' hive apart, on his command, another orc army was sent to overwhelm the high city of Acheron. But that was before the sky exploded. Orbital bombardment blasted craters amongst the orc hordes. Even as they gaped skyward, they saw Thunderhawks peel out of the cloud cover, the roar of their engines audible over the concussive shockwave of their bombing runs the Space Marines, the finest warriors in the Emperor's service, had arrived. The Blood Angels, the Ultramarines, and the Salamanders attacked, and the Orcs tasted the bitterness of crushing defeat for the first time. At that moment, if Gazgul had turned his attention to the deteriorating situation, 
it is likely he could have rallied his armies and driven off the Space Marine counterattack. Had he done so, Armageddon would likely have fallen. However, the completion of the Siege of Hades' Hive had become an obsession. Prophet though he was in the red haze of battle, Gazgul no longer heard any calling save to grind his iron boots upon those who had dared defy him. Finally, Gazgul's own bully boys broke down the last blast door. With the inner gates now open, Gazgul threw everything at the Hive City, unleashing his final rampage. The Space Marines arrived too late to save Hades' Hive, and those inside were massacred nearly to a man. With his numbers depleted and widely scattered, Gazgul commanded the last of his reinforcements to besiege Tartarus Hive. The freight of the planet hung in the bands, but the Space Marines were quick to redeploy. A drop pod assault struck the orcs even as Gorkonauts and Stompers smashed down the Hive's gates. Blindsided again, the Greenskins were pushed back and on the very verge of breaking when Gazgul arrived. His counterattack was just beginning to wrest the initiative back when Gazgul and his bodyguards disappeared altogether. Rumours that their illustrious war boss had fallen spread like wildfire amongst the orcs, and they wavered and then broke. With this, the Imperium thought that they had driven the orcs from Armageddon, but it was not so. Many fought their way into the ash wastes and escaped, eventually reaching the depths of the equatorial jungle. Moreover, Gazgul was not slain. Some say the hand of Gork reached down to extricate his chosen one. Gazgul's few orc detractors claimed he had fled, but however it had happened, the orc warboss escaped off-planet. Visions of the Prophet After leaving Armageddon, Gazgul was not idle. He did not look upon that campaign as a defeat, but more as a necessary stumble that was a part of a larger journey, for a master plan had been revealed to Gazgul by Gork and Mork. Now, the warlord saw clearly that Armageddon was not the end, it was only the beginning. Clarity of Vision If the Imperium made one huge mistake following the Second War of Armageddon, it was in not immediately pursuing Gazgul with all their strength and available resources. Yarrick recommended hunting him down, but few heeded the battle-proven Commissar. In truth, the Imperium's high command on Armageddon presumed that the Orc Warlord that came out of nowhere to ravage their planet either was dead, or, if he had survived the battle, would be a washed-up nothing. He might live for some time as a recluse, but if he attempted to gather more Orcs about him, he would doubtless be slain as a failure. Nothing could be further from the truth. After losing a major battle, orcs will often depose their failed leader, the first step on the downward spiral to true anarchy. It is true that, early on after his escape, Gazgul did have to remind some tribes of his greatness by defeating his challengers in horrific fashion. However, the warlord regained his followers' full support, not just with his triumphal acts of violence, but through his words. What the Orc gods had revealed to Gazgul, or rather, what Gazgul said they revealed to him, was that in order to destroy their foe, you must first know him. To the Orcs, such an idea was both radical and profound. This meant that, for Gazgul, the whole invasion of Armageddon was merely a way to test the waters, an experiment to learn how the Imperium would interact against a massive invasion. The swift space marine strikes and the grinding attrition of the human warriors had indeed been eye-openers to an orc from the isolated world of Urk. Now, Gazgul had learned what he needed to know about the Imperium's strategies. It was time to regroup or to gather new armies, to rebuild and restore the war until it had strength enough to menace entire star systems. Onwards to Golgotha. Most of Gazgul's forces had been left behind on Armageddon, only a core of his most trusted mobs were with Gazgul when he landed in the heart of what was notorious Orc territory, the world of Golgotha. In ages past, the subsector had been heavily colonized by humanity, but since then it had passed through the grasp of various races until it was ultimately conquered by the Orcs. 
That war, however, had run out of impetus long ago, leaving behind many disparate and interfeuding tribes. Just like on Urk, Gazgul began subjugating the Greenskins. At first, he clubbed bosses and gained new mobs one at a time, but news travels fast when orcs begin to get excited. Whether it was due to the tremendous power of his adamantium skull headbutts, or the orcish wisdom he received from his visions from Gork and Mork, soon whole tribes were seeking out this new warlord. Thus began decades of long rebuilding. Carefully, Gazgul balanced marshalling the growing numbers of his army with the exponential war energy alongside the need to keep a low profile for the time being. Gork and Mork had advised him that he did not want to draw outside attention upon himself just yet. Never before had a war leader tried to limit the numbers of orcs he attracted, but it was all part of the plan. Before he could take that next step towards ultimate victory, Gaskell would need more than just an enormous army. He would need to have his new tactics perfected and his new weapons working properly. He knew that if his influence expanded too quickly, the plan would not yet have grown ripe. Still, Gazgul launched raids across Ultima Segmentum and beyond. Some were small, consisting of a few mobs. Others were massed assaults capable of overrunning a planet. The attacks hit Imperial outposts or wreaked havoc among shipping lanes. The orcs also ventured into Tau space to smash colonies or attacked other orc territories. Gazgul led some expeditions, while for others he put a new corps of sub-commanders to the test. Beyond the value of plunder or even winning the engagements, the raids were done to train new leaders and test his latest strategies. If the Imperium had collected and analysed their scattered data files, they would have been alarmed by how many recorded attacks Gazgul or armies bearing his insignia had made. From 945 to 996 Millennium 41, there was an escalating pattern of violence with many thousands of raids. But the Imperium was sprawling, bureaucratic, and beset by more obvious threats. Only the aged Yarek, who had never ceased in his pursuit of his nemesis, still warned about any impending war directed by Gazgul. In the year 997 Millennium 41, Gazgul allied with the most infamous Bad Moon warlord in many millennia, Nazdreg Ug Erdgrab. The two leaders field tested innovative teleporter technology the ability to send mobs of boys, vehicles, and ultimately, even the mountainous gargons from a far distant space hulk down onto a planet. This was tested on the Imperial planet of Priscina IV. Only the Dark Angel saved that world from being overrun, but victory there was not Gazgul's real goal. His preparations were now over. He was ready to unleash his full force against the Imperium, exercising a plan fifty years in the making. Return to Armageddon In light of its importance to the Imperium, Armageddon's defenses were overhauled after Gazgul's first invasion nearly overwhelmed the planet. The star systems surrounding Armageddon were now heavily fortified. New naval stations and orbital defense platforms gave Armageddon a level of protection bettered only by Terra and a few others in the whole of the Imperium. Against a war that Gazgul unleashed, this did not matter. With a grinding inevitability, Gazgul's junk-laden armada plowed into real space and advanced. In their wake, they left devastated planets as they steered towards Armageddon. Imperial task forces that sallied out to intervene were swallowed whole, never to return. In rightful panic, the distress call went out, asking for reinforcements before the orcs could reach Armageddon. On the day of the Feast of the Emperor's Ascension, 57 years to the day after his first invasion, Gazgul returned. The orbital battle over Armageddon raged for two fiery nights, but by dawn of the third day, the skies were filled with the vapor trails and the incandescent afterblaze of orc dropships. In a roaring wave behind them came swarms of atmospheric fighter craft and swooping bomber jets. Gazgul chose not to fight at Hades Hive, that indomitable high-water mark where his last invasion broke itself. 
this time there would be no such defiance. In an act of terrible vengeance, giant asteroids aimed by orbital space hulks smashed the entire hive apart, annihilating its inhabitants and its defenders. This was but a prelude to the bloodshed that would follow. Ground-based defense lasers and missile platforms reaped a horrific toll upon the orcs, filling the sulfur-yellow skies with crisscrossing energy beams and blossoming explosions. Yet the Greenskins were coming down in such numbers that, already, vast armies were building in the ash waste. Feral orcs and commando teams burst from their equatorial jungles and mountain ranges of Armageddon to join the growing throngs. Quick-hitting strikes by the troops on the ground wrested control of many macro-cannons and defense lasers, weapons that would soon be turned upon their former owners. Other orcs worked to construct landing strips, allowing Dakar jets and Blitzer bombers to refuel and re-enter the fight more quickly. Gradually, the orcs began to dominate the dogfights that had been taking place overhead, and they soon ruled the skies. Anywhere that the Imperial forces gathered to establish the defensive line were subjected to punishing bombardment and strafing runs. Through surging spearheads and the unbridled fury of their attacks, the orcs were gaining the upper hand everywhere. However, at that stage in the battle, many chapters of space marines began to arrive. Once again, their rapid assaults threatened to unravel the Greenskin's advance. Gazgul had foreseen this and prepared his own countermeasures. It was betrayal, not battle, that fell the first hive as Acheron was captured by treachery from within. To aid the wars raging across the Ash Waste, Gazgul signaled for his next surprise. In orbit high above Armageddon, space hulks and asteroid fortresses jettisoned chunks of themselves to plummet downwards to Armageddon. The Orc Rocks were unleashed. Rocks During his first invasion, Gazgul found his attacks blunted by rapid strikes from space marines. Despite the high mobility of the Greenskin armies, they could not match the Adeptus Astartes' quick-hitting capabilities. Worse still, the stymied Greenskin advances turned to routes before Gazgul could counterattack. The rocks changed all that. Orc rocks are hollowed-out hunks of asteroid that have been fitted with crude engines and weapons and filled with troops. They descend from orbit and their fiery trail is slowed somewhat by powerful force fields, retro rockets and modified tractor cannons. On Armageddon, the rocks made landings in the verdant equatorial jungles and across all of Armageddon's continents, not just upon the populated landmasses of Primus and Secundus. Some rocks were lost to ground fire or smashed apart by their own impact, but many more survived. Not only did they slam into the planet to crush anything below, but the shock waves of these landings were devastating. Even as the space marines began their attack runs to stall the orcs' advance, they found the rocks crashing amongst them. Each landed rock became a bastion for the orcs, a rallying point and a ready-made fortress. But there was more. As well as guns, the rocks contained teleporter arrays like those first used by Gazgul in his Persina campaign. They were swiftly used to bring orc reinforcements to the planet, counteracting the space marines' attacks. They included special marine killer mobs, stompers, artillery, and even gargans. Blazing new trails. Despite more and more space marine counterattacks striking deep into the orc battlefronts, the rocks and the teleported reinforcements had the Imperium once again back on its heels. Gazgul still did not relent. Rather, he pressed his advantage. This was the perfect opportunity to unveil another tactic from his long-prepared arsenal of devastation. It was time to cut loose the Speed Freaks. Orc cults of speed have been around as long as there have been orcs. Their velocity-addicted warriors are extremely mobile, every trooper being mounted on some type of war bike, war buggy, or truck. While every clan has its speed-crazed orcs, this tendency is most common amongst the evil sons. By their very nature, all speed freaks are fast, impulsive, and likely to charge at the first opportunity. Only the commanding presence of Gazgul, a no-nonsense goth, 
had any chance of using such headstrong forces in as controlled a fashion as he did. By Gazgul's orders, the speed freaks were held in reserve. It nearly killed them, not to be first in battle, but instead to sit, doing nothing but driving their engines and waiting. Patience is not a virtue found among speed freaks, yet Gazgul had been quite adamant in making his case, making it, in fact, with his adamantium-plated head. By turning the wayward evil son's warlord, Gurbhag, and his custom bike into a bloody scrap heap of broken parts. It had been a convincing argument. Only when the special teleporter mobs had been sent to punch holes through the enemy lines were the speed freaks set loose. Dynamos of the War Despite what the growing orc legends said, the true genius of Gazgul Thraka had nothing to do with his rock-splitting headbutt. What really set Gazgul apart was his leadership. It was his gift to be the best out of every orc that made him so dangerous. Few warlords can mesh the different clans, playing each to its strength, rather than leaving them to work towards their own narrow-minded proclivities. Though Gazgul liked a hard and fighting core of goth warriors, he always picked the right tool for the task at hand. However, he did not do so alone, for Gazgul also had an eye for spotting orcs destined for greatness. Scattered about War Gazgul were a range of the most talented orcs to stalk the galaxy. This was not a formal council, but a loose ring of the most powerful and influential war bosses from the tribes, along with the most overachieving odd boys. Perhaps the most famous amongst this group was Orchimedes, the genius mech behind such inventions as teleporter technology and attack submersibles. When he remained lucid, Mad Doc Grotznik was also in this group as was the evil son's warlord, Zagbos Skargrim, the aged but still mighty, snakebite grand tusk chieftain Moloch, militant-minded commandant Clank of the Blood Axes, Nazdrek of the Bad Moons, and perhaps a dozen others. Even when Gazgul was not nearby, these dynamic lieutenants acted in his name, ensuring his plans were carried through. In essence, they became the right hand of War Gazgul. Annihilation in the Ash Wastes Able to exploit the tiniest gaps between battle lines, the speed freaks raced off in long columns. Where they needed to widen the path, the war bikes blazed away with their weaponry, unloading a storm of shot that scythed down wood guardsmen in wide arcs of red ruin. Speed freaks are known to sacrifice armor for speed, but in true orc fashion, their bikes and light vehicles never skimp on firepower bearing more weaponry than any sane creature would expect upon such light frames. Across Armageddon Prime and Secundus, roving bands of speed freaks tore over the open plains of Ash Desert, with names like the Red Wheels, Burning Death, and the Slashers. Each war horde of speed freaks was made up of dozens of smaller war bands. The clouds of dust they kicked up as they accelerated across the barrens rivaled the toxic outflow of the gargant big mobs, which spewed exhaust fumes that could be seen from outer space. Focused on the myriad battles spread across the spawning continents, few of the Imperial officers had time or tactical acumen enough to contemplate the big picture. Most would have denied that the orcs even had a plan. Pointing to the scores of assaults scattered across the vast planet, they saw the orcs attack more as an anarchic mess than as a planned battlefront. But they were mistaken. Gazgul orchestrated the fighting on Armageddon, and it was his tactical genius that designed the deadly combination that was winning the war. The scattered rock landing sites had created strong points from which orc armies gathered, and they also served as homers on which the teleporters could lock and beam down a steady flow of reinforcements. It was necessary for the Imperium to concentrate their attacks upon these sites, leaving them vulnerable to the lightning assaults of the speed freaks. Even as the forces of the Imperium moved to eliminate the threat of the rocks, they found themselves being hunted. Fast and hard-hitting speed freak columns wreaked havoc upon the Imperial forces in the open plains, weaving in and out of different formations and launching daring hit-and-run raids. Zagbos Skargrim, notorious leader of the Burning Death Speed Freaks, encircled and destroyed entire regiments of Imperial Guardsmen. The Burning Death were well known for their love of fire, 
The trapped humans were herded into larger groups, setting up mass scorcher runs that lit up the night skies. Streaking above the ash waste, air wings of Ducker Jet and Burner Bomber squadrons acted as mobile artillery for the speed freaks. A fierce competition between the air and ground forces began, with each side striving to kill their target before the other could join the battle. Many friendly fire incidents were not accidental, but the deliberate results of overly frustrated rivals who arrived on the scene to discover their foes already destroyed. Assault on the Hives The Imperium's forces and counterattacks were wholly fixated upon the old rocks and the speed fleet warbands that wove maddeningly out of their reach. At this stage in the battle, Gazgul deemed the time was ripe to attack the Hive cities. The warboss personally led the many hordes on their route to attack Hive Infernus. Even as the few Imperial reserves were committed, word came from the seaport Hives of yet more massive orc attacks there. Mysteriously, orc rocks had made landings in the fire wastes and dead lands of the north and south of the main continent of Armageddon. These grim lands had been believed to be uninhabitable, but their value became apparent weeks later when hundreds of tanker-sized orc submersibles rose from the polluted waters and made landings at Hives Tempestora and Hell's Reach. Surprise was total, and within days, Tempestora fell. Although Hive gang militia held out long enough at Hell's Reach for Tempesta science and space marines to arrive, preventing the orcs from overwhelming the other half of the Hive. Besieged and bombarded, Tartarus Hive drove off their green-skin attackers, but the victory was a hollow one. The Hive was ruined, its great factories torn apart for scrap by industrious Death Skull scrap mobs. Just south of the plains of Anthrand, a vital water processing plant known as Gatana Bay was the site of a battle that escalated to become the largest dreadnought conflict of the campaign. Large vehicles, could not navigate the maze of pipes that made up the vast refinery, and without armor to oppose them, the dread mobs were an unstoppable force, able to gun down or smash aside all the human infantry that dared defend those twisted corridors. The orcs were only checked by the arrival of space marine dreadnoughts from no fewer than five different chapters. Tank busters and space marine devastators moved into the tangle of pipelines, hoping to shift the balance upon that deadly battlefield. Although the orcs were ultimately forced to withdraw, the damage wrought upon the facility by the Greenskins was irreparable, cutting off water to much of Armageddon Prime. Endless War of Attrition The size of the escalating war in Armageddon was becoming difficult to even imagine. Billions of lives had been lost in the unending battle, so that the very world had become a byword for war and destruction on a massive scale. It was a place where the mightiest war machines in the galaxy clashed, and heroes died in their droves. Orcs from across the galaxy felt the vibrations of the war, like moths to a flame. The most aggressive green skins were being drawn towards Armageddon, seeking fame and glory. But the third war for Armageddon had spread beyond the planet, for the whole subsector was rife with orc raiders. But those worlds, left vulnerable by the Imperial commitment to the Armageddon War, were now burned themselves. Rumors abounded that Gazgul had called the Ragnarok. The Great War. The final apocalyptic battle in which the orcs would prove their worth before the eyes of their violent and primitive gods. To counter the orcs, the Imperium had been forced into a total war footing, feeding the meat grinder with entire planetary populations worth of troops. A thousand light-year recruitment zone was established around Armageddon. Every Imperial world within the area had their ties of Imperial Guard regiments tripled, and their industry turned over solely to armaments production. Even the Imperial logisticians, themselves numbering more than a large army, could only estimate how many Imperial Guard had taken part in the defense of Armageddon, to say nothing of tracking the wealth of other forces. At the last tally, this included elements of at least 24 different chapters of Adeptus Astartes, several orders of Adeptus Sororitas, and six Titan Legions. Within the sector was a better part of 17 Imperial fleets. Worse still, those figures were outdated by at least a Terran year, a time period in which the war had only grown larger. 
The Imperium had always dreaded the unification of so many Orc tribes, and now its worst fears were coming true. Although the wisest of the Imperial leaders faced the grim realization that it was likely that the industry of Armageddon would soon be ruined beyond repair, the war was now less about saving Armageddon and more about preserving its subsector and, most sobering of all, preventing the ever-swelling tide of orcs from growing larger. If the great green menace could not be contained upon Armageddon, then it would sweep outwards and threaten the heart of the Imperium itself. Holy terror. Although it pained him to leave the largest battle he had ever seen, Gazgul knew he had work to do elsewhere. The Great War Only the pull of destiny could drag the most dangerous orc warlord away from the battle that raged across Armageddon. But with the great green vision starting to overwhelm him, Gazgul knew it was time to move on. That battle was now self-perpetuating, and he was needed to spread the ripples of war energy until they washed the galaxy in blood. Even as he waded through shell bursts and claimed space marine helms for his trophy rack, Gazgul could feel the pressure building behind his adamantium plate. He was about to have another vision, and, if the pain in his skull was any indication, it was going to be a monumental one. It was too much to fight. Gazgul returned to his orbiting ship, Kill Brekar, and at last gave in to the green flashes that were filling his patchwork mind. A higher and louder calling. The voices of Gork and Mork had never been so strident, their bellowing still echoing in Gazgul's head. Yet no matter how many times he readjusted his thinking parts by beating them against the bulwark of the ship, Gazgul could not clear his head, nor decipher what the guttural voices of the gods were saying to him. The pain of the visions was excruciating, and his good eye bulged as he roared in agony. Any other orc would consider a good strap like Armageddon a victory in itself, but they lacked ambition. Gazgul, blessed with his conqueror's vision, did not know exactly what he was looking for, and grasped only that he could not find it on Armageddon. Trusting that the voices would become clear in time, he ordered a handful of craft from the fleet that still surrounded Armageddon like vultures to gather around Killwrecker. Gazgul left the battle for Armageddon, knowing his appointed lieutenants would command in his stead as he had ordered. The greatest orc warlord of his era looks back upon the rapidly shrinking orb of Armageddon, and his only regret was that he doubted he would be back before his underlings conquered everything in his name. As the fleet gathered speed, Gazgul turned from the portal and looked about the bridge. On his orders, a herd of weird boy warpeds had been gathered. It was his hope that the deranged orc mystics could aid his visions in a way similar to how their strange gifts seemed to help steer the best course once a space hulk entered the warp. Thus far, however, all the weird boys had done was annoy Gazgul. The hulking warlord watched the drooling warpeds totter about the bridge bumping into each other like boys in a fungus beer stupor. In truth, such antics angered Gazgul. The old goff in him resolved troubles or ambiguities with a simple punch to the face. Unbeknownst to Gazgul, however, his departure from Armageddon did not go unmarked. Imperial August stations observed the Orc Thotila leaving the system, identifying the vessel known as Killwrecker, the capital ship favoured by Gazgul. High Command was notified, and within days the pursuit was underway. Commissar Yarek headed one fleet, and High Marshal Helbrecht of the Black Templars led the other. They had allowed Gazgul to escape once, and it cost them dearly, a mistake Yarek vowed that would not be repeated. Using a pincer approach, the faster, more efficient Imperial warships converged upon the Orc fleet several weeks after leaving Armageddon. Outnumbered in the midst of a barren space known as the Haunted Gulf, Gazgul realized he could not outrun his foes. With nowhere to hide, he ordered the fleet to steer directly into the midst of their enemies. By the weight of their broadsides, the Orc flotilla might yet be able to blast a path to freedom. Despite Yarek's warning that such a desperate maneuver was not just possible, but likely, the forces of the Imperium were still surprised by the unorthodox gambit. 
Several battle cruisers were left crippled by the orc ploy, little more than drifting hulks. However, the return ripped the scrap fleet apart, destroying ships one after another. Killwrecker was left listing badly, its steering wrecked, as Yarrick and Helbrick prepared to board the orc vessel in order to personally ensure Gazgul's demise. Killwrecker was wreathed in a blaze of green energy. The Great Green Beyond Killwrecker rocked back and forth from the lance strikes that penetrated its lower decks. The resulting explosions blasted concussive force through the ship, making the entire craft lurch violently and sending everyone on the command exploring. Gazgul toppled over hard, his adamantium-clad skull denting the steel deck plates with a clang. Furious, he pushed out of the pile of weird boys that had shifted on top of him and bellowed orders. It was then, his head still ringing from the impact, that an overwhelming force possessed Gazgul. An arcing crown of green light exploded outwards, washing everyone in a strange green light. The sudden explosion of energies was a spark that set off the warp heads, each convulsing in rhythmic spasms that grew in intensity. Engulfed in green flames, the crazed orc psychers howled as their skin sizzled and raw power burst forth from their eyes and gushed forth from their jaws. In voices like rolling thunder, the warphead spoke as one. The same almighty roar of Gork and Mork that Gazgul had been hearing. Now, at last, he understood what he needed to do. The voice of the gods commanded Gazgul to unite the orcs and make the galaxy echo to the sound of the Great War. The powerful voice spoke again, saying that only unending battle would call the final Ragnarok, bring forth Gork and Mork themselves. With their role in delivering the message done, the warp heads exploded in a vast outpouring of energy, drenching all those on the command deck with wet viscera and luminescent green energy. It was this surge of green power that rolled outwards, striking the enemy fleet like a tidal wave. With their ship systems ensnared by strange energies, Yarrick and Helbrecht could only watch in frustration as Killwrecker blinked once and was gone. The only evidence that it had ever been there was a trail of debris floating where the ship had once been. Yarek slumped, for he knew that Gazgul's escape boded ill for the galaxy. The Path of Conquest Killwrecker was hurled into the warp, its course and destination unknown. Every greenskin on board endured an unsettling journey in which the echoes of that mighty voice still boomed in their minds. How long they travelled or where they spun towards, none could say. Then, with a feeling similar to a punch in the gut, they halted, reappearing suddenly in real space. The orcs staggered to the portholes, looking out and gasping in amazement. They were completely surrounded by spaceships of all sizes, but there could be no mistaking the make of such crude, rust-bucket-like craft. Killwrecker had materialised precisely in the middle of an orc fleet. Only recently, Killwrecker had been an imposing vessel, its hulls protected by overlapping slabs of iron plate and bristling with turrets, gun decks and all manner of ordnance. However, after the Imperial fleet had punched a number of holes through the craft's belly, internal explosions had done the rest. Gazgul's wrecks began to swarm over the ship, repairing breaches to the inner hull and patching up the pipes which vented gases into the corridors. The orcs under warlord Ergok the Slayer, for that was whose fleet that they had appeared amidst, doubtless took Killwrecker for space junk, thinking that some scrap-mongering death skulls or salvage-crazed mechs were simply cutting up pieces of old wreckage. On board, Gasgor cared less about the hull repairs, instead ordering the mechs to fix the damaged teleporter. Meanwhile, while they hustled about their task, the prophet of Gork and Mork prepared his boarding parties. It was easy to pick out where the biggest orc would be, for just above them in the centre of the fleet was a monstrous space hulk. So much work had gone into that vessel that it now looked like an orc fortress floating in space. Knowing his advantage was surprise, Gazgul trusted to luck and teleported blindly. As if guided by the great green hands of Gork and Mork themselves, Gazgul and a mob of his baddest knobs, his bully boys, appeared in a green flash in Warlord Urgok's command room. The action that followed was swift and bloody, the deck soon covered with the mangled corpses of the slain. 
Before they could recover from their shock, most of Urgok's bodyguard were slain, and Gazgul had pulled Urgok off his throne and beaten him senseless. And so started a new war. Gazgul's new fleet. Urgok's fleet was substantial in size before Gazgul arrived, but it grew exponentially when the prophet of Gork and Mork took over. Like all orc-made creations, it was an anarchic jumble. Most of the ships were wholly built out of cast-off flotsam scavenged from the ends of the galaxy. Others had once been the vessels of some other races, but had been salvaged and upgraded by the orcs. They came from all corners of the galaxy, some even from distant eras, having been found drifting in the warp. Even ships of the same type in the same squadron were rarely comparable, for each had gone through many impromptu builds and refits, each using whatever scrap could be found. It was not the greenskin way to repair things either, so much as patch over them, and no mech was ever fully satisfied, but thought he could add another gun deck, missile silo, torpedo tube, or other shooty whatnots here or there. Within that ramshackle armada was a pair of heavy proud hammer battle cruisers that had stood keel to keel with Imperial battleships and come out to victors. Some half dozen kill cruisers and terror ships rounded out the larger craft. Before them came a tide of lesser vessels, some little more than rust buckets with thruster engines. Yet they were deadly despite their worn and decrepit appearance. The pride of the fleet was Urgok's Space Hulk, a colossus of a starcraft with far power to almost equal that of an entire Imperial battle fleet. Building a new war. Warlord Urgrok's empire had grown so large that it took weeks for Gazgul to work his way through it. Most joined the prophet of Gork and Mork willingly. Some stubborn cases needed to be shown a few messy examples before they saw the wisdom of lining themselves under Gazgul. When he regained consciousness, Urgok the Slayer himself became a leader within Gazgul's throng, and this made recruiting the rest of his armies easier. If the galaxy was going to be set ablaze with war energy, many more orcs were needed. Orcs are a prolific race, and can be found throughout the entire galaxy. It would be the work of a million lifetimes to seek out every greenskin-held territory, to travel to the innumerable places where greenskins gathered in dominating forces. Countless moons, planets, asteroid fields, or space hulks drifting in the void between the stars. As Gaskol knew, such travel was not needed, for all orcs were called by the power of the war. Urgok's wars had been drawing in a steady stream of greenskins, new recruits rising to the call of fighting, space travel, and the promise of greater battles. Under Gaskol, this rivulet became a cascading downpour as floods of greenskins rushed to join the fleet. Now, they needed purpose. With agitated orc hordes rearing for battle, Gazgul steered the fleet towards orc territory. The remnants of his war-tuned brain had felt the distant ripples of green energies that came from distant Octarias. Rumors had come of a new leader of that realm, and it was Gazgul's intent to wrestle the title Overfiend of Octarius for himself. However, what he found when he got there was even better. The Octarian War Octarius had been Orc territory for many thousands of years. It was not as backwater a subsector as where Urk had been, and every so often a leader would rise up, call a war, and lead an invasion off to wreck some part of the galaxy. Indeed, the old warlord Gorsnik Magash had rushed off to join Gazgul in the Golgotha sector and was currently heading a vast force of orcs on Armageddon, holding his own in the Deadlands. Since Gorsnik's departure, a new leader had quickly risen to fill the power vacuum and claim the title Overfiend of Octarius, a Descal warlord named Zog Steeltooth. Despite his copious use of blue war paint, the rule of Zog Steeltooth had thus far not been a lucky one. Tyranids had returned, sweeping into the biomass-rich orc territory, consuming entire planets as they advanced. The fight raged across the whole sector, its epicenter squarely targeted upon Octaria, the central world of the Greenskin territory. The entire mega-continent of Octarius was a battlefield into which both sides poured their might. The Overfiend's orcs, grown big and strong in their diet of constant war, had met their match. 
the ever-evolving spawn of High Fleet Leviathan were gaining the upper hand, showering the planet with reinforcements, sending yet further broods of killing beasts into the non-stop melee. Across Octalia, the orcs were forced to take refuge in scrap iron fortifications. It seemed only a matter of time before the Tyranids would collapse each of the jury-rigged fortresses. Then, while Gazgul descended upon the spore-ridden skies. At first, the Overfiend's orcs thought the rocks blazing through the atmosphere were some kind of new foe. All across Octaria they landed, smashing gaping holes through the gargoyle-filled skies and plowing into the scuttling hordes on the ground. It was not slime-covered, chitin-plated Tyranid creatures that emerged from the asteroids, however, but more orcs. They surged outwards, taking the fight to the Tyranids, whilst the rocks themselves opened up with heavy caliber ordnance. The greenskins behind their shabby defenses let loose volleys of cheers and hail of supporting fire of their own. Then came the heavy, ground-shaking footfalls of incoming creatures of immense size. The hive mind had noted the arrival of these new invaders. The Tyranid response was frighteningly quick. Larger swarm creatures, hulking sized limbed horrors and giant sized beasts lumbered to oppose this new green skin threat from the skies. The raucous chants of Octaria's orcs died in their throats, for they knew that these towering behemoths had been held in reserve, save for the final death strike. When the orcs' defenses had been breached, these monsters would have arrived. Now, the newcomers would be shredded, for there could be no hope for infantry out in the open. To their surprise, the air flashed as teleporters began to bring more reinforcements. All across Octaria, the cratered rock landing sites now blazed with unnatural light. After each flash, more and more mobs appeared, and these were not just infantry. Arising with guns chugging, Gorkonauts and Stompers concentrated their firepower on the larger foes, whilst at their feet, Burner Boy mobs spread out. With each blast from their weapons, they sent blooms of red fire leaping out to flash fry the lesser creatures in droves. Amidst the mobs pouring forth, countless crude banners and totems could be seen, carried high by the newly arrived troops, or mounted atop clanking battle wagons. The orcs of Artaria saw the symbols, and knew who had arrived. At Gargates, the Overfiend's shanty capital, Gazgul Thraka himself appeared by a teleporter. He led the charge at the head of his bully boys as they crashed through the serpentine raveners that were beginning to undermine the first lines of defense. To the greenskins I've watched, this massive warlord in mega armor fought like Gork himself. He wove in and out of sight in the swirling carnage, but he was easy to pick out. An aura of green brutality seemed to surround him, and he clobbered each of his foes so hard that limbs, heads, and claws flew in bloody arcs all around him. He moved like some elemental destructive force, a one-orc wave of destruction. His custom shooter spat death, and with every swipe, Gazgore's power claw sliced multiple foes in half. Every motion, from his elbow swinging to the stomp of his iron-shod feet, cracked the shell like armor of the Tyranids and sent more to fall, thrashing their death throes on the blood-strewn ground. Then, the unbelievable happened. The body-strewn landscape at Gazgul's feet seemed to buckle and bulge upwards. Then Gazgul was gone. A Morlock had come. It burst from below, and as its bulk breached the surface, the creature coiled about itself like some hideous, constricting serpent. This was the largest such creature any of the assembled orcs had seen, the deadliest spawn of its kind that ever slithered underground or was seen by the light of any sun. The triumphal screech, that burst from the beast's gaping war, twisted metal, and made orcs miles away fall and cover their ears. Even before its screech of victory was over, however, something had gone wrong. The Morlock heaved, flopping its mass so that it seemed the world itself trembled. Then the beast quivered, writhed in convulsions, twisting its mighty coil in arcing loops. An unnatural bulge formed in its midsection and out thrust a power claw amidst geysers of gore and slime-covered entrails. Shooter blasts widened the hole, and out stepped Gazgul, striding out of the very belly of the beast. The mightiest of orc warlords roared his victory to the skies, a rallying cry to greenskins, and a challenge to all else that lived. After that, nothing could stop the orcs. 
chanting their warlord's name, the Greenskins of War Gazgul went on a kill rampage, hacking, shooting, and slaying in a berserk frenzy. From behind scrap iron walls, the orcs of Octaria burst forth to join in. Even Zog Steeltooth, the overfiend of Octarius, was chanting the name Gazgul as he gunned down the living wall of Tyranids that attempted to stay the Greenskin onslaught. A great butchery began, and it did not stop until Octaria was free of the creatures of Leviathan. Another Armageddon. Octaria was scoured clean of Tyranids. After the display of might that had been witnessed, all of Zog's lot joined Gazgul. More and more orcs from many light years away were arriving daily. This was good news. As reports brought back by Gazgul's fleet told of an enormous cloud of bioships already en route. Somehow, Highfleet Leviathan had sensed the gathering riches of biomass centered on Octaria. Correspondingly, it sent forth yet more of its tendrils towards that sector, hive ships already bulging with weapon beasts ready to assault. Though Gazgul had little time to prepare, he made the most of it. Mechs welded iron-plated walls back into position, or patched acid-eaten holes. Others sighted new cannons and anti-aircraft weapons, better integrating the rocks into the overall defense. Under the keen eyes of Orchimedes, a few snazzy upgrades from teleporter pads to Possa rockets would give the intergalactic aliens something new to chew on. If anything, this fight looked to be bigger than the one on Armageddon. Already, the skies began to darken as a huge brooding shadow covered the stars above. Looking up, Gazgul bared his fang-like teeth in as close to a grin as he could manage. This war was only getting started. <laughs>